Well, we're in April 20, 2019. My last video about the problem of black hole was uploaded in 2017 October. You know, we are a year and a half after. You know that uh, scientists said that a big new, they got a picture of a black hole. This is a picture. Immediately, everywhere, they said, this is a proof that the black hole does exist. We have an image. In 1979, the French astrophysicist Jean-Pierre Luminet was the first to produce an image of a black hole, what it would look like. To do that, he used the Schwarzschild metric. So, what you see is a non-rotating black hole. To produce an image of a real black hole, people should use the Kerr metric, you know. But this is much more complicated. So, all the images that we can see on the net, almost all, are made with the Schwarzschild metric. Such an image, in any case, based on the Schwarzschild metric, would be unrealistic, and it would be the result of the collapse of an object. Even with very small rotational movement, this last should be enhanced, like for a neutron star, whose rotational velocity can be a thousand times per second. But this is a detail, anyway. What the astrophysicists say, if you would be close to a black hole, you will see something like that. I mean, some sort of dark spot. For rotating black holes, that would be similar. On this image, the black hole is supposed to be alone. There is no disk of matter all around it. But you can also imagine that such an object would be surrounded by matter, by gas, forming that we call an accretion disk. From that disk, the matter is continuously poured into the object, whirling around it in large spiral path. Now, imagine that the central object would be a black hole. Let's get closer. What would we see? A black spot surrounded by odd case circling around. Where does the radiation come from? Around this compact object, the case transform into a plasma is circling at high velocity. We know that when we move electrons along circular path, they emit synchrotron radiation. So that this object is a powerful radio source. So what was pictured recently at the center of the galaxy M87? The galaxy M87 was discovered in 1781 by the French astronomer Charles Messier. This EV spherical galaxy is located in the cluster Virgo, which is composed by 2,000 galaxies. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is composed by 200 billion stars. The span is 300 million light years. M87 is bigger and heavier. Its span is around a million light years, three times larger than our Milky Way. It is 200 times heavier. Our nearest galaxy is Andromeda, which is two and a half million light years distant. M87 is 53 million light years distant. Since 1947, astronomers identify a radio source at the center of this galaxy. More recent and precise image reveals the presence of the large jet extending at very large distance, composed by hot gas expanding at relativistic velocity. By the way, there are two lobes symmetrical, but the second one is not visible due to relativistic Doppler effect, but it still does exist. If we could see this object from another angle, 
we would see the two lobes like that. It is just an artist's impression. Here is a new artist's impression which shows these two jets. The Galaxy M87 is also a source of X-ray and gamma rays. The lobe extends over 250,000 light years and the expansion velocity is close to the velocity of the light. M87 is that we call a galaxy with active galactic nucleus. The analysis of the structure of the jet and of some rings located at the center of the galaxy seems to show that the activity of the jet is pulsating. Now let's go back to the picture published a few weeks ago. First, they are not the real colors. The object is not red and yellow. There are that we call false colors. This image just shows that the radiation emission is stronger at the periphery and weaker at the center. What kind of radiation? It is what is captured by radio telescope. The characteristic wavelength is around one millimeter. A technique called interferometry makes possible to extract a very weak signal from a large noise. The astronomer used a set of radio telescopes located at different places on Earth. The data are collected and sent to a big computer that produce this image. It can be shown that the capability of such a system is equivalent to a very, very large te radio telescope whose diameter would be equivalent to the distance between the most distant ones. The measure of the velocity of the gas circling around the object is found to be higher than 1000 km per second and it makes possible to size the mass of this object around 6.5 billion solar masses which is much larger than the mass of the central object that is at the center of the Milky Way. What about its size? It is larger than the size of the massive object located at the center of the galaxy. Its size is shown on the figure. It is several times the size of the orbit of Pluto. Now the question is, is it a giant black hole? I would say for all people except me, the answer is definitely yes. But it is not so simple. In the first precedent video, I have tried to show that this object could be a mass in subcritical condition. A mass whose radius is uh, lower than the critical radius and uh, larger than the Schwarzschild radius. In such condition, there is no event horizon, there is no central singularity, the object can be described by a couple of internal metric solutions, external metric solutions. This drawing represents the two-dimensional image of such object. It's a blond cone. As I showed in the precedent videos, the mass becomes critical when the pressure turns to infinite at its center. I think that this causes the inversion of the mass and the excess mass is evacuated because this negative mass is repelled by the object. It cut cross completely the mass of the object because positive and negative masses only interact through anti-gravitational forces. So that the object simply behaves like a water flush and the water flush cannot overflow. Whatever large is a poured mass, 
If I am right, such object would naturally get the subtrical configuration. For neutron stars, this limits their mass to three solar masses, which is a subcritical mass. Consider the object pictured at the center of the galaxy M87. Even if it doesn't correspond to a black hole, to such exotic geometry with event horizon, even if it is a subcritical object, it would be so close to the black hole configuration that it would distort space all around it and produce this kind of image. What about the black spot at the center? If it is a black hole, that spot would be perfectly black. No light could come from. If it is a subcritical object, the light emitted by the object would experience a strong gravitational redshift. The corresponding energy would be greatly weakened so that the central part would be dark. What about the matter around it? If it is a black hole, this gas circles at a velocity that tends to the velocity of the light. If it is a subcritical object, this velocity would be smaller, but large enough to produce strong synchrotron radio emission. As a conclusion, this image could correspond to a supercritical object. In the future, it will be very difficult to discriminate between the two models, the black hole and the residual supercritical mass. In this second object, the central part would produce some weak infrared light, but observer would argue that such light could come from the dust that is present in the galaxy. Anyway, the observation shows a thin jet emitted by the object in two symmetrical directions. This suggests that this plasma emission is focused by a very strong dipolar magnetic field. Okay, but how does this huge magnetic field get formed? How a 6 billion solar masses gets formed at the center of that galaxy? What makes such massive objects to take place in the center of so many galaxies? I have suggested a theory 20 years ago. I will illustrate the idea taking the example of a rotating galaxy. The equilibrium of the case is ensured if the gravitational field balances the centrifugal force. I have features the case as a layer of water in blue with constant thickness. The shape of the rotating basin represents the gravitational field, which is mainly due to the surrounding repellent negative mass. In the genus cosmological model, the action of the negative material on the positive mass depends on an apparent mass density which is proportional to the square root of the ratio of the determinant of the two matrix. So that if there are joint variations of the matrix, the strength of the confinement varies. If it is weakened, we can picture that pulling down the edge of the basin. Then the water will escape. In the universe, this produces very irregular galaxies, as pointed out by the astronomer Alton Harp in his well-known catalogue of very irregular galaxies. If you make numerical simulation and introduce this sudden loss of confinement, you will immediately get such fuzzy patterns. When looking at such picture, the English astrophysicist Sir James Jeans said that, as it implied huge forces, one could not resist to think that it would reveal the existence of some unsuspected metric property of space. Now back to a rotating basin. Suppose the confinement would be reinforced due to joint metric fluctuations. We can simulate that pushing the edge of the basin up. 
then we will create a circular tsunami in water that will go towards the center of the basin, like that. From an astrophysical point of view, this is a density wave. Do we find such structures? Yes, they call it Hog galaxies. The one shown on the picture is not the result of a collision, because it is very isolated in space. This ring of gaze is not circling around the center of the galaxy. It has a radial velocity. In the case, the typical random velocity, similar to some thermal velocity, is around 1 km per second. Same thing in all galaxies, the Milky Way. In general, the velocity of the density waves in case is higher, so that they are similar to shock waves. Same thing for spiral structure. Such waves compress the gaze and trigger star formation. The young star emits ultraviolet radiation that ionizes the gaze and creates a phenomenon of fluorescence. That's where we see density waves in that old galaxy or in spiral galaxy. When this circular wave reaches the center, we get a spherical mass of gas with high temperature and density, high enough to satisfy the Lawson criterion. Immediately, fusion occurs in the bulk, in the wall mass of gas, and then we get a quasar that emits as much energy as a wall galaxy. I think that the quasar phenomenon is a transient phenomenon. I have presented this model in a book published in 1997, 20 years ago. The title is uh, Half Part of the Universe is Missing. Here are the features of the book. In the galaxy, you have a weak magnetic field whose intensity is around 1 microgauss. On the first image on the left, you see this magnetic line perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy. In the density wave, the young stars ionize the gaze and create strong magnetic Reynolds conditions. Then the magnetic lines are frozen in. When the wave moves towards the center, it gathers such lines together. This enhances the local strength of the magnetic field. When those lines are crushed at the center of the galaxy, due to the conservation of the flux of the magnetic field, the intensity reaches some thousands tesla. Fusion produces hot plasma that follows the magnetic lines. Then you get two jets. As the magnetic field decreases at distance, you get a very powerful natural particle accelerator, which is the very source of the so-called cosmic rays. Of course, this model is somewhat different from the mainstream model based on the energy emission from a black hole. After a strong energy emission, fusion ends. At the center of the galaxy, we get a remnant mass cooled by radiation emission, which keeps its huge magnetic fields, which takes part of to its final equilibrium. Joint metric fluctuations occur from time to time, which brings more matter and trigger fusion and energy emission. That's for the jets are not regular. Similarly, we find rings around the object. Anyway, if I am right, the configuration of these objects would be limited by the criticity. When some more matter is carried to the object, it creates a shock wave. It warms the gaze and triggers new energy emission, but at the same time, mass inversion occurs, which eliminates the excess matter and maintains the objects close to criticity. As a conclusion, 
I think that all massive objects located at the center of galaxy are the remnant of a reiterated quasar mechanism. Well, I think I must be the only one French crazy astrophysicist who is still skeptical about the existence of the black holes, whatever they are giants, medium or small. Someday nature will say which model is a good one. But, you know, I am 82. So I think that when this answer will come, I will probably observe all that from the paradise. Anyway, it's time to sum up. Can we draw the long story of this Janus cosmological model? At first, in 1967, the Russian Andrei Sakharov tried to explain the absence of primeval antimatter. Then he suggests the existence of two entities, positive matter, or matter, and twin matter. This last would be located in a twin universe. Our universe and this twin universe would be linked by the initial Big Bang singularity. On the figure, you can see a two-dimensional didactic image of this uh, Sakharov's model. In this model, uh, our universe is on the right and space is featured as a one-dimensional space, a simple circle with a P point. And the twin universe is on the left. And same thing, it's a closed universe. But as you can see, the arrows of types are opposite. Andrei Sakharov assumed that these two universes were enantiomorphic, I mean p-symmetric, so that the wall would correspond to pt-symmetry and even to cpt-symmetry. As you know, all our common equations of physics are cpt-symmetric, so this could be the origin of the idea of Andrei Sakharov. I don't insist Andrei Sekarov assumed that the primeval antimatter was located in the twin fold. Ten years later, I published in the French Compte Rendu de l'Académie des Sciences two papers introducing a model where the two entities are interacting. Same thing, the arrows of times are opposite and there are enantiomorphic folds. From a geometric point of view, it corresponds to uh, the folding of the Sakharov model that way. The puzzling question was about this inversion of the arrow of time. What could be its physical meaning? The answer was given by the mathematician Jean-Marie Suriot in 1970. He published that in a book entitled Structure des systèmes dynamiques, published in French, and then it was translated in English in 1997 with the title Structure of Dynamical System. Well, this theorem can be found page 190. It was based on group theory. It showed that uh, when the time was reversed, then the energy was reversed too. As the energy is mc square, it implies that uh, energy inversion goes with mass inversion. It was tempting to introduce negative mass in astrophysics and cosmology. I tried just by intuition to deal with the following interaction schema. Uh, masses with same signs mutually attract, and masses with opposite sign mutually repel. But it is not what comes from the Einstein model, ruled by the Einstein equation. We know since the 50s that the corresponding schema from the Einstein equation is the following. Positive mass mutually attract through Newton's law, 
negative mass mutually ripple by anti-neutral's law and a puzzling system, the positive mass escapes chased by the negative mass. This is the source of a, an unmanageable effect called the runaway effect. The two masses get kinetic energy infinitely. As the negative mass has negative kinetic energy, the energy is conserved. So the physicists cannot deal with such thing. In 1957, as shown by Hermann Bondy, the conclusion was that we couldn't put negative mass in a cosmological model. In 1994, I was the first to introduce a bimetric model of the universe with two metrics and two subsequent field equations. According to this uh, Janus model, ruled by uh, two coupled field equation, positive masses follow the geodesics as derived from the first metric, negative masses follow the geodesics as derived from the second metric. Then the interaction schema was this one that was published in the Italian journal Nuevo Cimiento. Considering a mixture of positive and negative masses with equal importance, numerical simulation showed how the two spaces separated got divorced. On this figure, the positive masses were featured by circles and the negative mass by crosses. And on the right, uh, one is gray and one is white. But it did not look like the very large structure of the universe. So I tried to look at a fairly unsymmetrical system in which a negative mass would be dominant. Then this last formed a series of negative mass clusters. They repelled the positive mass in the remnant place. Here you have the two together. And it corresponded for positive mass to observation to some sort of uh, joint soap bubbles. You probably know that the mass in the universe is arranged around big voids, uh, hundreds of uh, light years diameter. In 2017, the mapping of the universe at large size showed the evidence of what was called the grid repeller. I think that a negative mass cluster lies at the very center of that void and repels the galaxy. We don't observe this cluster because negative mass emit negative energy photons that our eyes and telescopes cannot capture. By the way, galaxies take place in all in the negative mass distribution which confine them and uh, ensures the flatness of the rotation curves. The surrounding negative mass focuses the light rays due to negative lensing effect, so the strong uh, gravitational lensing are explained by the presence of this uh, surrounding negative mass. Due to dynamical friction, this negative mass environment produces the spiral structure. This simple primitive bimetric model made possible to give the explanation of a lot of observational data. In 2002, two other researchers, a French academician Damo and Jan Kogan, published a 40 pages essay in the journal Physical Review D. The approach is very different. They consider two brains interacting through a massive graviton and consider a spectrum of mass. From an action and a Lagrangian derivation, they build a system of two coupled field equations and re recognize on the right the letter T, which is supposed to represent the interaction term but they are unable to define how the interaction works so that no result arises from this essay. 
In 2008, the German mathematician Sabine Ossenfeld there publishes a paper in the journal Physical Review D based on the Lagrangian derivation. She gets her own system of coupled field equation more refined. Here I put together the three systems of coupled field equations. Top, left, mine, 1994, then the system of Damour and Coggan, 2002, and then Ossenfelder, 2008. Notice the similitude. Their first members are identical and similar to the first member of the Einstein equation. These come from the general derivation technique as introduced by David Hilbert to build the Einstein equation. Surprisingly, Sabine Ossenfelder did not keep the path. She didn't publish any more paper about that. She missed the target. In effect, she weights the model by the a priori assumption that the two sectors must be symmetrical, so that her paper doesn't provide results that could be compared to observation. The model I had introduced in 1994 could not provide time-dependent solution with full asymmetry. In 2013, I modify the system and get an interpretation of the acceleration of the cosmic expansion. Rapidly, my friend and co-worker Gilles D'Agostini develops the calculation and shows a very good agreement with available observational data. The two papers are published in Astrophysics and Space Science. On the figure, the data from 740 supernovae, which shows the acceleration of the cosmic expansion. In 2015, I introduced new Lagrangian derivations that makes possible to extend the model to radiative era, published in Modern Physics A. And in 2019, a new slight modification solves the problem of the description of the geometry inside a star, published in Progress in Physics. During years, we have desperately tried to collaborate with Sabina Sonfelder. We proposed to visit her in our laboratory in Frankfurt. No answer. I confess I am not comfortable with her mathematical tools. In effect, in her Lagrangian derivation, she introduced mysterious pullovers. This is a serious call if anybody understands what is a mathematical pullover, please contact us. To us, it remains a perfect mystery. I did everything I could do. I made a nice portrait of her and I sent it. It was appreciated, but after many years of scientific silence, I received suddenly that abrupt message. The equation that you use are the equations that I derived in my paper. You should not pretend that those are your equations. It is factually incorrect and easy to prove wrong. I know that you did it previously. If you continue to do so, I will see myself forced to write to the journal's editor and take your paper down, Sabine. Nothing else. As you perhaps know, Sabine is well known over all the world by a blog, Back Reaction. In this blog, she comments all kinds of scientific subjects. Last year, she made a comment about Jamie Farnes' toy model. As a conclusion, she says that Farnes brings more problems than he brings solutions. But not a word about Janice, or about her paper of 2008. Moreover, in 2018, Sabine Selfender publishes a book 
entitled Lost in Math, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray. A contrarian argues that modern physicists' obsession with beauty has given us wonderful math but bad science. Whether pondering black holes or predicting discovery at CERN, physicists believe the best theory are beautiful, natural and elegant, and this standard separates popular theories from disposable ones. This is why Sabine Ossenfelder argues we have not seen a major breakthrough in the foundation of physics for more than four decades. The belief is beauty has become so dogmatic that it now conflicts with scientific objectivity. Observation has been unable to confirm mind-boggling theories like supersymmetries or ground unification invented by physicists based on aesthetic criteria. Worse, these too-good-to-not-be-true theories are actually untestable and they have left the field in a cul-de-sac. To escape, physicists must rethink their methods only by embracing reality as it can science discover the truth. Again, in that book, not a word about Janus, nor about uh, Asenfelder's work about Bimetric. Back to her message, it seems that suddenly Sabine discovers the large benefit of a Bimetric approach of the universe and claims for her priority and due. Why not? A few days later, I decide to send her a message. Saturday, April 13, 2019. Dear Sabine, you know, I am 82. I have few years left. What's important to me to move the things? Why don't you write a paper showing that the Janus cosmological model corresponds to a peculiar case of your system of coupled field equation, if you think it's the case? You could sign this paper together, and that would be cleared up. We are not enemies nor competitive. We could be co-workers. You are a brilliant mathematician. You could bring tremendous results. We need you. Together we could make a breakthrough, get new works, publish books. Immediate answer. Dear Jean-Pierre, I do not wish to collaborate with you. I want you to stop pretending that the equations that were very clearly derived by me are yours. With my best regards, Sabine. This represents a sub part of the history of science. But after all, who knows, perhaps Sabine Ossenfelder is the Einstein of the third millennium? Well, we are in 2019, since 1977. As you can see, it's a quite long story.